All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our second episode of The Singing Brain. I'm so excited to introduce our guest, Dr. Amy Belfi. She is an assistant professor in psychology at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. She received her PhD in neuroscience from the University of Iowa and was a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Psychology at NYU. Dr. Belfi's research is focused on how music influences our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. This is going to yeah. be fun. It's a pleasure having you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your background in neuroscience and music? Sure. So um, I always kind of grew up playing music. Um, play, I played piano, sang in choirs, was pretty into that. Um, but I knew that I didn't want to pursue that as a career. And I was really, I got interested in neuroscience in my AP psychology um, class in high school. I just liked the week where we talked about the brain. So I went into college knowing that I wanted to be a psychology major, knowing that I wanted to focus on neuroscience. Um, my college didn't have a neuroscience major. That's kind of, I, some colleges do, some don't. It's, I don't know, becoming more of a thing. Anyway, um, and then when I was an undergrad, I think I read a couple papers about music in the brain. And that was really kind of at the from fairly early stages of the field of music neuroscience, like cognitive neuroscience of music. And then I decided to pursue my PhD and got really lucky that my PhD advisor kind of gave me freedom to choose my topic. And I was like, well, I've always liked music and it's really interesting. So that I kind of just stumbled into it and I've been working on it ever since over a decade now, which is- Wow, that's incredible. And so cool that you were, you know, sort of at the forefront of the field at, at the beginning of, of when all of this was kind of beginning. That's really cool. Yeah, I guess I would say that like the first like neuroimaging studies, I guess, with music, where I in the very late 90s, early 2000s. And so I started college a few years after that. So sure. uh, not, not, not like super forefront, but like I was kind of in my, I guess, formative academic years, kind yeah. of in this field. I mean, that's still so cool, though. And so you're obviously very knowledgeable about it. Um, so you've done some really cool work with Spotify. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your work with them? Yeah, so that um, was a really fun experience. It was kind of, you know, aside from my academic work, and I think partially because I was working at NYU at the time, and um, they they have an office in uh, New York City. So that was really cool because so much of the work that I do and, and people in my field do is definitely applicable to um, mus the music industry and the stuff that, you know, like the folks at Spotify, what they're interested in is about how, you know, people perceive music and how, why we want to listen to music and why we like music. Um, but the specific project I worked on with them was actually a collab, kind of a collaboration between Spotify, Ford Cars, and <laughs> myself. And they were interested in um, how listening to music in the car can, you know, just really they were interested in the interaction between music and driving and kind of left it open to me to decide what question was feasible to look at. Um, and we were interested in looking at how, um, you know, we had a few conversations and then we thought, well, one aspect of why we listen to music in the car, to, at least from our anecdotal experience is that we listen to it to, you know, put us in a good mood. <laughs> um, <Right>. so <laughs> we, we listen to it because we like it. And so we were interested in seeing if there were specific types of music that when paired with a commute um, would, change your mood in more positive ways than other types of music. Um, There's like, you know, a, a million different ways you could ask this question. We were kind of constrained in terms of what we could do. Uh, it was a relatively quick timeline, but it was pretty fun. We did some like focus groups in some of the Spotify offices. This was all done in Europe too, which was like even more fun for me because I got to go to Europe and do right. this. <laughs> That's awesome. So we did some focus groups where we like asked people, this is a little bit out of my expertise because this is more like qualitative style of research, but we asked people, you know, like, what do you like to listen to when you drive? How does it affect your mood, et cetera? And then we did more of a quantitative study where we, we gave participants playlists that were chosen on. So Spotify has labels that they give, um, you know, each piece of music based on different dimensions. Um, and the ones we looked at were what I would call valence and arousal. So valence meaning the emotional kind of quality of being positive or negative. Okay. Um, so like a positive valence would be happy or joyful or, um, you know, 
pleasing, whereas negative valence would be like angry or sad. And then arousal is the other dimension. I think Spotify calls it energy. Um, and that's more of like how stimulating or relaxing. And so we, we made different playlists that had different combinations of these factors and gave them to participants, had them listen to them while they did their commute and had them rate their emotional state um, before and after the commute. And what we found was that the, the playlist with the high energy or high arousal tended to have the most positive um, influence on the participants' emotional state. So it was really fun. That um, is so cool. And Spotify and Ford are not bad uh, companies to work for. So that's, that's pretty great. Yeah, it was, it was an awesome experience. Like I got to go to Europe. I got to work with like really cool people totally outside of academia. Like, you know, it's fun to do stuff in different industries and especially something that's so relevant to my own work. Like it was a really awesome, totally one of the most fun thing I've, I've done in this job, I think. So you mentioned, uh, you know, talking about your commute and sort of how music can affect our commutes. Neurologically speaking, how can picking the right playlist impact, you know, say a morning drive? Yeah, and that was kind of one of the, you know, motivating questions for the, that Spotify and Ford project. Um, and, you know, we, we were looking at these specific dimensions of like valence and arousal. We found that like the high arousal music tended to be, um, you know, the, how the people who listen to the high arousal music tended to rate their emotion as changing more positively after driving and listening to that music. So it had like the, the, the most effect on their change of positive emotion. Um, and that's just one dimension. Something that's hard with when studying music is, is that there's so many, not only are you looking at the music itself, but um, you know, there's people have a lot of associations with music and people have very different preferences. Whenever you're doing psychology research, there's always individual differences, but music, I think, and aesthetic stuff in particular, there's a lot of individual differences, just like people like different stuff. Right. Um, so I think in some ways, people are really intuitive about what they're going to like. Like, we probably know better about what to listen to in our car ourselves than what my research is going to tell. Like, I, I didn't set out to be like, this is what you should listen to. It's just um, we wanted to see, like, did these different types of music have different effect? I would really like to see, and a question we had, but we just didn't have the power, we couldn't get enough participants to do it, was would different types of music differentially affect um, your morning versus your evening commute? So, like, I could see why the arousing music would maybe be better on your morning commute, but if we had done it, like, separating out morning and evening, maybe you'd want something a little bit more calming or chill in the, in the sure. evening. Sure. Interesting. That's my personal suspicion, but like, <laughs> um, no, but yeah, sense. I mean, obviously, at least from that study, we did see that music of a certain type, in this case, high arousal music could influence your mood in a positive way. Sure. Uh, and, and another thing we didn't really look at, but I think can, is, is certainly also the case is that um, music can be distracting. So that can be sometimes good. If you're like on your commute, which you probably drive all the time and are really bored, right. then it's probably good to have music that's gonna be interesting to you. Whereas if you're in a new driving situation, um, it's probably better. You know, a lot of times if you're driving into a city and it's like traffic or, and you've never been there before, you're going to turn down the radio or tell everyone to shut up in the car. So <laughs> way it's like distracting to have other stimuli going on. So right, right. So many different factors with looking at music and driving that, that, you know, and there's not a ton of research on it really. Oh, there really isn't. There really isn't, which is why it's so cool to, you know, get to talk to you about the work that you've done. It's, it's hard to do, and I've been, I've been toying around with the idea of like doing it with driving simulators and stuff, but I just don't think it's quite as, I don't know, real as, as I mean, the good thing about the study with Spotify is we did it in like the real world, but the bad part about doing stuff in the real world is that you have a lot less experimental control. So there's right. kind of like the balance between the two, but um, yeah, maybe I'll pick that stuff back up someday. So you mentioned, you know, how we sort of intuitively know our music um, preferences. We know what kind of music we like very quickly. How does our brain make such quick decisions about our taste in music? Yeah, so I, I've done a, I have one big, pretty big study, I guess, where I did several experiments looking at that question, which was really what I was curious about was how quickly do we know if we're gonna like something. Um, and this actually kind of weirdly connecting into the driving thing was kind of <laughs> a little bit inspired by the idea of, you know, when you're sitting in your car, flipping through the stations, 
you kind of know right away at least you feel like you know right away you're like okay next 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 yeah country station next whatever like right uh, and so but I wanted to really precisely try and identify what's the minimal amount of musical information or the minimal amount of time spent listening to music Mm -hmm. that you need in order to know ultimately whether or not you're going to like that piece of music so we did this study where we had people listen to really short snippets of music that got progressively longer and longer and after each snippet i asked them to rate how much do you like this music so you'd hear like a little bleep and i you know half a second of music and i'd say right. how much do you like this rate it on a one to nine point scale and then it would get longer and longer and eventually you'd hear like a full you know a longer version of the piece mm -hmm. and what i wanted to see was at what point in those shorter snippets did your rating match your rating of the long piece so at what point did you say okay i think this is a great song um and then at the end you also said this is a great song so what at what duration could you match your final rating and so what we found is that within, you know, less than a second, people were able to, to make a rating of the music that matched their rating of the full piece of music. Wow. So essentially within one second, you're going to know whether or not you're going to like the piece of music, um, which is really quick. And it, it's in line with other types of ratings. So people have found that within, you know, less than half a second, really, you can tell whether or not you've heard a song before, whether it's familiar. Um, you can also rate kind of the emotional quality of the song within a second. Um, so even a small bit of music is able to, to convey a lot of information. But what was kind of new about my study was that not only was this looking at kind of more clear cut information, like, have you heard this before? Yes or no. But I was looking at a more complex, at least what we think of as being complex type of aesthetic judgment. How much do you like this? And you know if you're going to like something really quickly. So it seems like we have these kind of gut feelings mm -hmm. about how, how much we like something and they tend to be really accurate and really match up with how we judge them when given a longer amount of time with them so I say like don't feel bad about like skipping to the next song if you don't <laughs> like it because like that's listening to it longer probably isn't going to change your mind yeah it's good to know like if I hear a song for a second and I'm like maybe I should give it a chance I probably shouldn't because I yeah. probably won't like it anymore than I did the first second <laughs> that's funny um okay so lastly in, in our last episode we we learned a little bit about how music can evoke you know very specific and sort of visceral um emotions and also memories from us can you explain what is the difference between music and the memories that are tied to that versus a picture, for example? Yeah, so so this is something I'm super interested in, continue to work on is the looking at the connection between music and autobiographical memories. So autobiographical memories, meaning memories of things that happen to you in your life, experiences from your life. Um, and I think most of us have the experience of hearing a song and having it take us back to a particular moment in time, even if, totally. you know, it could be a song you haven't heard of or a memory you haven't thought of and you hear the song and just like takes you right back. Comes back, um, right. And I just wanted to kind of investigate this question. And also there really had it, this, despite the fact that, like I said, most of us have this experience, there's actually a, a surprisingly little amount of research on this topic. Um, mm -hmm. When I started looking into it about 2011 or 12 was when I started this work, there was, only a, literally a handful of papers in this topic. So wow. my first question was just, can we, is music better at this than other stuff? I, some of us feel like it is, but maybe it's not. So I wanted to compare memories triggered by music to memories triggered by pictures. Um, and so I did this study where I had participants come in, they listened to a bunch of songs, they looked at a bunch of pictures. The pictures in this case were um, pictures of famous people. Um, because I thought they were pretty comparable to songs and that they're like pop culture, every, they're familiar to everyone. Um, so um, they listened to the songs, which were popular music, billboard songs. They looked at the pictures and then they told me any memories that were triggered by them. And what I found was that the memories evoked by the music tended to be more um, what I call episodically detailed or episodically rich. So they contain more pieces of information that are actually about the memory. So um, if I heard a song and I said, oh, this song reminded me of when I was in my college choir rehearsal and we were practicing for a big performance and I was really nervous. And I remember wearing these really scratchy feeling robes and gathering around in a circle with my friends and singing this piece. Okay, so that's like an autobiographical memory. And there's a lot of details in there, like the scratchiness of the robe, 
feeling nervous, those kind of emotional and physical perceptual details. Music evoked memories tended to have a lot of those, whereas the memories evoked by the pictures of the people tended to be more what I would call semantic or just contain factual information. So it might say, it might be like, oh, Clint Eastwood. I love Clint Eastwood. I remember going on a date to see one of his movies. I don't know. I don't know why Clint Eastwood popped into my head. I can't even think of a movie. But these were like middle-aged <laughs> adults who are doing the study. So anyway, <laughs> like, I remember going on a date to see this Clint Eastwood movie. And he was also in this movie, this movie, this movie. He was a really good looking guy and his voice sounded gravelly or whatever. So it was more like, they would kind of start out with a little bit of a memory mm -hmm. about going to see the movie, but then it would transition into like a laundry list of different movies he was in or his co-stars or what he looked like. And so it was less about the personal kind of episode, the details of your memory and more about that facts about that person. So it seems at least in that comparison, um, memories evoked by music tend to be more detailed in terms of their the contents of the memory tends to evoke a specific instance rather than factual knowledge. Wow, really interesting, really interesting stuff. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. You clearly have a vast amount of knowledge and, and you know we appreciate you sharing just a little bit with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.